If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Jordan Harbinger has to be one of my favorite people. Oh, he's a great one of my absolute being, favorite well, people. Well, I have like there's a there's a he he holds a little special part in my heart because of uh the way he treated us so early on when we first started podcasting. So I have so much respect, admiration for the guy. I, I'm uh He's my, one of the best uh podcasters uh in the podcast world. Yeah. Like one of the best, one oh. of the best interviewers. Um at the time when we first met him, he was hosting the Art of Charm. He has now split off from them and has his own podcast. But he was so gracious to us way back when he was massive and we were small mm-hmm. and uh, just always been nice to us. Yeah, so. the, yeah that Jor- stuff goes a long way. It's the Jordan Harbinger show now, and there's no doubt in my mind the guy's going to you know, be huge. Oh, like he's he going to be for great. Our, yeah, if you, if you, he's got a, a very loyal fan base If already. you've never listened to Jordan uh, interview people or podcast, you are missing out. Like He is a... Bro, Tony Hawk, Larry King, Shaquille O'Neal. Like, this guy has interviewed some of the fucking biggest names right now, mm-hmm. and his skill set is awesome. Yeah. We get to talk about that in this episode. I mean, what he's going through right now, and what I love about Jordan is that he's op- he was open enough to to be vulnerable on the show. Because it's and, what he's going through is extremely well, could stressful. You Im- could you imagine building a multi... I mean, I can. It's it's a, Obviously, this is something that could technically happen to us, right? We're all sitting if we all fucking broke off and went different directions. And I mean, to build something as big as Art of Charm. Yeah, right. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> it would never happen, right? Nah, we all got too much love for each other. The, but to have built something as big as Art of Charm, I mean, this is a huge, this is a huge business. There's they have a ton of employees, they got a ton of different revenue streams. And for it all to literally be pretty much ripped from out from underneath him, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I couldn't um, that's gotta be so fucking I mean, he says in the in the episode, it's the most stressful, scariest. He's never experienced anything like this. Oh, multiple times he almost cried in the episode. I don't yeah. know if you guys looked over at him yeah. when yeah. we got into some topics that hit him that was just like you could tell he's very emotional and vulnerable. No, and you can and, just feel that off. And of him. and there's a lot of useful information in this episode if you are going through a stressful time if or building through, a business. Building a business like if you're if you want to know about the skills about podcasting, about how to you know ameliorate stress, like we talk about mm-hmm. a lot of that in this episode and it's extremely entertaining. We are interviewing a great podcaster, which means the the conversation is awesome. Always. And he's always got great stories, yeah. great energy. So it was a fun podcast, even though it was over like pretty serious topics. Yeah. Now, if you're a hardcore Mind Pump fan and you want to do us a favor, do this. Go to the Jordan Harbinger Show. That's his podcast. Check it out. If you like it, subscribe. We want to send people over there because the guy's fucking awesome. He's got a great show. We think he brings a lot of value, uh, but he's also a good friend of ours. So go check it out. We also mentioned one of our sponsors because there was a time in the episode where Sal Start was talking about different types of herbs that you can use, and you got into some of the Four Sigmatic products. Yeah, so, well, Four Sigmatic uh, is one of our sponsors. Um, some of the things that we you could use for stress are the chaga and the cordyceps may actually help you as well. Now we are sponsored, so it's foursigmatic.com forward slash mind pump, and then enter the code mind pump and you get a discount. Also, check out Jordan Harbinger on his show, The Jordan Harbinger Show, and you can find him on Instagram at Jordan, and his last name is spelled H A R B I N G E R. So without any further ado, here we are talking to our good friend, Jordan Harbinger. I'm trying to remember what when the last time that we were all together was. It's been a, it's been a while. You stop what you stopped by at, at night. What what were we doing that night when you came by here? That was the last time I think you came by here, right? You guys, we were had dinner either, or something. We oh, that was before the first. That, that was the first time. That, the, yeah, when we met with the ben first Greenfield. time, we had dinner with Ben Greenfield. Oh right! And I, am I allowed to say that you guys were uh, on a journey that evening? <laughs> <laughs> What's that mean? You're allowed to say whatever you want. Uh, yeah, you can right. say yeah. That's you, a you were on theory. a you were on a journey that evening, and 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 my wife and I were there, and we thought this is the first time I ever met you guys. So normal was you guys <laughs> like <laughs> like that, yeah. and you're already like this. So it was kind of my wife was like, these guys are so funny, man. You guys, you guys, you should hang out with these guys more. And I, and I remember not hanging out with you guys enough because I was going through so much stress, which is, you know, kind of coming to a head now, which is one of the reasons that we're in this room again. Right, right. Yeah. Dude, I, I'm re- the first time we met, I was, uh, you know, first we hit it off with Ben first. Ben was the one who introduced us to you. We all had dinner. 
you know, and I don't know if it, we all consider ourselves people, 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 or what it is. But when you when you meet somebody, you can just I have a really good judge of their character. And I remember after we all hung out, like all of us said, like, dude, that's a really cool dude, a very secure dude too. Because something that I have found in this space, much like every other space that I've been a part of in business is people uh, become very like territorial or insecure about giving it information. Scarcity or, mindset. Yeah, very yeah, scarcity yeah. mindset. And you were actually one of the first people that was in this space and have been doing it for a long time, been very successful at it. That was like just an open book. Yeah, open about your business and everything, giving us insights. Oh, yeah, we, you, we haven't got that from a lot of people. You helped us yeah. out a lot and you answered questions for us and you were very honest. So we all we will always be indebted to you. Absolutely. Because that was early on. You know, was it was how long ago was it? Oh, bro, this was before we never had a sponsor, so we didn't even know what to fucking expect for sponsorships or what we should be looking for. Yeah. We never looked into potentially doing networks with each other. We didn't know what would be considered good downloads or not downloads. Like, so many questions that I remember having for you, and you just literally kind of laid everything out. And I believe that we're like that. I mean, you know, I'm an open book. You can ask me anything about sure. the business, I'll share. We were talking just the other day, uh, and I'm real quick to tell you all that information because I think it's really funny and, and unfortunate when people kind of hoard, <laughs> hoard info like yeah. that, you know? Yeah. I, I found that when I first started the business, the art, my old business, the art of charm before, uh, all of this drama went down that we'll get into, I guess in a bit that people were, there were some people that were really open about everything, but a lot of folks were kind of cagey or secretly competitive. And I realized like, oh, these people aren't really, they're not really cheering for us. They're kind of like, oh yeah, here's this opportunity that I might give you that sort of like does this other thing for me, this introduction that makes me look good. But really, you know, it's kind of, there's, there's, there was always sort of this like frenemy or caginess. And I always thought this is so uncomfortable because now I don't know who I can believe or trust mm -hmm. or open up to. So I just decided early on, like a decade ago, maybe slightly less, that the best thing to do is to be open and vulnerable wherever you can. And then some people will be really uncomfortable with that and you just kind of won't click with them. And other people will be like, oh, good, we can have real talk. And those people <laughs> become your friends. That's right. right. The way I look at it is you, we have two choices that we make in life and business and whatever. And the two choices are be truthful, honest, uh, and open. And the other one is to be calculated and sneaky and not honest. And I think sometimes, not always, but sometimes being sneaky might protect you. But I also believe that more often than not, the being truthful and honest one is going to result in a better circumstance or better results. I think that that's more often than not the case. And so I'm going to choose that. Plus, uh, you remember when you were a kid and you would have a friend and you'd make up a little story and then, you know, a couple days later, bigger, you got to make up another story to back yeah. up that story. And yeah. then next thing you know, it's it's all bullshit. Like everything's a lie and it's a terrible way to live. And I never want to do that. I learned my yeah. lesson a couple times when I was a kid doing that with friends. <laughs> yeah. Where they come over to my house and like, hey, where's that motorcycle you ride all the time? You know, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Show me those karate moves. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you were a black uh, belt you know, or some shit like that. Yeah. So. It's like, you know, be honest. We're, and you know what? This carries over into lots it of things. Carries it, over, and, right. it, and, you, and it ends up, and I don't do this because I know it's going to pay me back, but it has every single time. And now you're in your situation now, and now you can call upon friends like us, and we'll fucking jump at the opportunity to have you on the show and talk about certain things and help you out. Yeah, I can't even tell you guys. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to come back, of course. But I got to tell you, one of the, there's been a lot of gifts that have come out of this particularly stressful situation, but I feel like maybe we should give a brief overview of like yeah, what the hell yeah. we're yeah, I, I mean, I know right now everyone's sitting on pins and needles because if you were an Art of Charm <laughs> fan, we have a out. lot of Mind Pump listeners that are also big Art of Charm fans, and everyone has been, it, it came, that's why I reached out to you. I said, bro, what's going on with you over there? And you yeah. told Someone me a couple- Someone on our forum made well, yeah. a post about it. Him and I were talking maybe a couple months ago, and Jordan's like, yeah, we got to get caught up. I got so much going on, bro. It's crazy over here. We'll get caught up. And so I just kind of gave him a space because I know he's going through a ton. And then all of a sudden, it started, my forum started talking about Art of Charm and like, what the fuck's going on there? I'm like, and then so I sent a message to you like, dude, what's up? This My forum is talking about your business now. What's, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So what the fuck is going on? So I, I'm i splitting from the Art of Charm and we're still in the middle of this whole split. And it's so I can say very little about that without I don't want to do any derailing of whatever might right, happen. Right. But you're in legal issues, right? Like yes. so, yeah. so people got to understand that right now. Yeah, so this is a legal tight thing. Rope. Yeah. yeah, I'm not like oh, it's private. I, I'm this legal stuff. I can't. I just don't want to. I don't want to damage the art of charm as a business. I. I. I but I, I got to be careful with, with that stuff. 
But what happened was I separated from the company and it did not, it was more sudden for me than I would have uh, liked. I'll put it that way. And so I am in a situation now where I don't know what's going to shake out uh, from that particular split. I do have the Jordan Harbinger show where I interview people and I continue largely what I had learned uh, through interviewing hundreds and hundreds of people. And I want to keep doing a show because I love doing shows and I love talking with people and it's all about the conversation. But yeah, I'm, I'm going through the, the most stressful time of my life right now as a result of the way that this is going. And I'm in a situation where I built with the, I built a show, the art of charm podcast, the old show I built that over 11 years and now I'm, I'm looking and our business was killing it. It was doing so well. Everything was working really great. And now I'm looking at starting over from scratch wow. with the mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. And it's so intimidating. It's daunting. It's scary. And what are your biggest fears about it? You know, um, my biggest fears, it's so funny because people are like, oh, don't worry, you know, you're you're not going to lose your house. And I'm like, no, I, uh, okay, yeah, I know that. And they're like, oh, no, you know, you still have your health. I'm like, okay, definitely, I got that. And then, but what, so it's not really, I don't have the same fears that a lot of these other people are suggesting, I guess, like the fears they would have. I'm so much less worried about income, paying the mortgage. Like, those are concerns, but I'm not like, oh, my God, you know, mm -hmm. I've... I've got I've got that Bitcoin, but also I, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe now that's not a really thing. <laughs> like a month ago, I was like, up yeah. Yeah. a month ago, I was like, I got Bitcoin. Now I'm like, yeah. fucking Bitcoin. <laughs> so no, but I mean, I've got you know, I have like an emergency fund and stuff like that. So I'm I'm less worried about that. But I look and I just think, how the hell am I gonna reach? all of those old AOC fans and all of the people that would like to listen to the Jordan Harbinger show, how the hell am I going to reach all those people now? I don't know how to do that. So my, and I remember I've gone on hundreds of other shows to get those people to find us. The word of mouth was going mm -hmm. for a decade right. on that show. How the fuck am I going to re get, rebuild that man? Yeah. Well, it's like looking at a mountain. You might be, so you're, you're comparing, I think what you're doing is you're thinking about all the hard work and effort and time it took to build your first show. And you're thinking to yourself, I got to have to do that all again, but it's not the same at all. It's right. not the same at all. First off, now people know who you are. The audience is going to hear that you're not on that show anymore. So they're going to be looking for you. So it's a completely, you're starting from a completely, you know what it reminds me of in, 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 in uh, fitness, there's this term called uh, muscle memory. And muscle memory is when, let's say I gain 20 pounds of muscle and I do it through you know, six years of hard lifting and diet and dedicated training. Everything's just perfect. And then all of a sudden, uh, I have a major injury or something and I'm just, I just can't work out. I can't work out at all for Bro, I'm a, I'm a six months. I'm a perfect example of this right now. Like I, I went from being a, a professional men's physique athlete to back to some of the worst shape I've ever been in my life right now. And I think what happened- And how fast can you gain it back now though? Because of it. muscle memory, right? That's right. So that's part of why I don't stress. But I think going back to what he said- what Jordan said was that I think what I what I have to do like because I I was battling some sort of depression right now with what I'm going through totally different situation but similar in, in in this aspect that really what it is that we're battling is our ego yeah and it's it, it it's it's challenging that it's like you know for ten years you you're the fucking man you you built something from nothing and you built something fucking bigger than most people ever build their entire life and now it's been ripped away from you and you're and you're thinking i got to start up you what you're probably going to build now is probably going to be totally different who knows it it'll, it'll be different and, and you're right about the ego thing i'll tell you i'll tell you right now the show quality i was talking with my marketer my producer and the, the other members of the team that are coming with me and they're like this is an opportunity they're all excited i'm like the only one that's fucking freaking out right <laughs> they're all producer jason's like this is great you know the marketing team everybody is jazzed my wife is like this is great you can do whatever you want you're not constrained by the format you can do these different types of interviews and i'm like I'm the one that's waking up at 3 a.m. and can't yeah. go back to sleep and fucking well, hyperventilate. You had it down to like a science. It, 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 you're, exactly. Like now I have all of the skills that I developed over the last 11 years. I got a lot of relationships that I've developed over over time like this that, mm -hmm. to, that'll help. Um, and so you're right. I don't have to do what I did in 11 years in a year or two to get back. I have to do the highest leverage activities that have worked over the last two or three years. Right. And I have to condense those down and do those in a way that get people to come through. Like 
losing the back catalog and all those old Art of Charm episodes is, is so tragic for me in a way. It's like losing a freaking beloved pet, maybe. I won't say losing a kid. That's obviously way worse. <laughs> but it's like losing a beloved pet, right? But at the end of the day, what a lot of people have said, which has helped me with this, is that those those all those exist. Those happened. Those those guests. Those the experiences, the conversations that I had with those people, they don't evaporate just because they're not in my RSS feed right now. Right, right. Um, but to your point, Sal, it's yes, it's ego. It's, to your all of your points, it's it's ego in that there's a part of my identity that was so caught up that is that I am the host of the mm-hmm. the show, the Jordan Harbinger show now, but I, I interview these types of people. I have this audience and they're, they're one of the best audiences in iTunes. They're most affluent. They're the most smartest educated audience in iTunes, which was actually true. I mean, we compared our demographic to NPR and the art of charm Jordan Harbinger show audience was more educated, more affluent oh, shit. than NPR. And I was like, look at all these smart people that come to listen to these other smart people that I get to talk to, and I'm in the middle of this. This is so great. So my identity was just so linked with that. So to start over, it's like, did I lose a piece of who I am? Mm. And I feel like it, anybody who gets fired from any company or gets uh, loses a job or gets, has, gets uprooted and has to move or something like that probably feels that sense of loss that's intangible mm-hmm. that has to do with especially like an athlete you retire and it's like what am am i an athlete anymore or was i this and now i'm just a retired you know overweight dude who used to play basketball so there's two things you you just highlighted something very interesting the the, what you're going through the specifics are very specific to you but the general what you're going through is an existential issue this is an issue that people go through yeah and so knowing that sometimes makes i know it makes me feel better when i've gone through certain things it's like okay I have my own specific set of situations, but what I'm feeling, the suffering of shedding my old self or, you know, am I this person who I thought I that identified with? This is a, this is a human issue. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is this, who are the people that know you besides you? Cause you know yourself better than anybody, but who are the people around you that know you the best? Who are those people? You named a bunch of them. You named yeah, your wife, wife, the people you work with who've come with you. Do the, do they know you pretty well? Oh yeah. Okay. Sure. And they're all excited. They are. Yeah. Every look now. What does that tell you? Everyone yeah. <laughs> has right. said, and and I mean non cliche speaking people who aren't just like patting me on that. Everyone has said this is going to be the best thing that's ever happened to you because you're going to be free of the constraints that you had at the old company. You're going to do the Jordan Harbinger show, which you have ownership over. You're going to be able to do things the way that you want. Everybody is excited. I seem to be the only one who's like, I'm like the last guy to get the memo. <laughs> yeah. And in yeah. fact, my producer sent me an email this morning because he was like, hey, how you doing? And I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I woke up at 3.45 and I didn't sleep much. And he, he, wrote, he, he goes, okay, um, I know I've told you this before. We give tough love every week on the show on, on Feedback Friday. And when people write in and we like give advice and stuff. And he goes, this is your tough love time. People are going to start losing fucking respect for you if you keep whining and you got to get your game face on. <laughs> and honestly, I was just like... He's right, you know. And my wife was like, "Yeah, dude, you're the only one who's not excited as hell right now." Right. And I get it, but like, your fans want to tune into the show. We got a call this morning. Someone just—I don't even know—is a little like, "How did he get her phone number?" So someone just called and was like, "Yeah, I found this number in like an email that I had, da da da." And it happened to just be my wife's mobile number. And he was just like, "I heard what happened, and I'm really sorry. And I, you know, loved you guys, and I've got this girlfriend because of you, and I, I've got this job because of you." And I was just like. It, it was incredible for me to to hear that, and so it. Again, I'm like the only person. The fans are excited. The fans that know about it are right, excited. Right. But for me, it, it's I I have to like process this stuff. But, sure, but I also have to be a leader in the company, and I also have to get my game face on because you can only mope around the house for so long before right. people are like, "Are we doing this, or are you gonna freaking Netflix all the, day?" You're, this, the, yeah. the people closest to you believe in you, brother. Yeah, you know what I'm it. saying. This, That's an awesome feeling. This yeah. reminds me of uh, some advice that I just gave a, a good friend, an old client of mine that was trying to get back in shape, and she was really depressed and down because. You know, she would just she competed before, so she's in great shape. And then yeah. she she got so caught up in work and uh, and put on all the weight, and she was just like kind of crying to me, saying like, "Man, I'm, I'm just so frustrated. I set my alarm five times this week, and I didn't get up for it for any time." And I said, "You know, th- I'm going to give you some advice that uh, now that is totally different than what I would have gave 10, 15 years ago." And and that's just because of my experience with people with motivation and self belief. 
I said, what you need right now is just some some small wins. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, especially when you get a guy like you who has huge goals that you've already accomplished, and then all of a sudden you get knocked the fuck all the way down again, yeah. and you're looking all the way at this huge goal. It's like, fuck, the, 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 you're going to get that. That's just time, right? It's just a matter mm -hmm. of time before you're there again and beyond that. So right now, like, focus on the small wins. So I tell her, I said, why are you so concerned about getting back to like where you were in shape and doing all these things and running this program and just training every day, getting up extra early. I'm like, how about go for a walk for an hour? Mm -hmm. Like, how about just go do one thing? And then have you done that since months? And she's like, no. And I'm like, okay, well set a very small mm -hmm. obtainable goal for you and get yourself some wins, get some wins that are heading you in the right direction to get where you need to be. And I feel like this is the same thing. Cause if you think about it, just you being on our show right now, if you were to rewind your life 13 years ago, would be a huge fucking win. This, yeah, of course. Right. If yeah. you were, if you were, if you were, you know, the old, you know, Jordan, Jordan Harbing, who's net didn't have any followers, any listeners, anything like that, and you're hanging out with the Mind Pump guys, bro, this would be a huge win. But it doesn't seem like that because it's like, I've been so much bigger and better. But <laughs> so you got to kind of remind yourself yeah. of that, like, you are, you are going to accelerate this business even faster than the other one because you're already doing things right now that would have taken you years to be able to do before. It's so true. Yeah, of course. And I'm calling it, I'll tell you, this is shit as this situation is. The gifts that have come out of it and are starting to come out of it. And I know this sounds like woo woo or cliche, but it, it, they're so real. I was watching this show called Dirty Money on Netflix, which is really good, by the way. And they were talking, have that. you seen that? Uh -huh. Do you see the payday loans guy? How the, they, this guy who does like payday loans, crap business, terrible greed, but he was facing a life sentence. And his brother, who he'd started the business with, he ended up committing suicide and stuff. And I felt like real compassion for this guy. And, you know, other people were like, yeah, screw this guy. He's a terrible person. Go to jail for life. Lose everything. I don't have any. And I was like, oh, man, I have real compassion. And I, when I see stories and when I hear other people tell me things, you know, it's, someone says like, oh, you know, I went through a divorce earlier, so I understand. It, it, when, if they told me that a month ago, I'd be like, oh, yeah, sorry to hear that. But now I'm like, I feel it yeah, in my yeah. yep. deep, in, really yep. deep in my, yeah, it's empathy. It feels like I feel it viscerally in my body when someone's like, yeah, I know you're going through a tough time. Uh, my wife's uh, sister passed away suddenly. And I'm like, wow, I have no real problems. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my God. You know, and I feel almost selfish for feeling negatively when other people have real, real problems but i also feel the sense of empathy the sense of compassion that i've never felt before and i appreciate every single person that writes into by the way my email is new it's jordan at jordan harbinger.com because i'm no longer reachable at the art of charm and people are writing in and they're like oh yeah immediately found your new show like i i can't believe i'm sticking with you and i just i i appreciate that stuff whereas before i was i would go through my email inbox and i'd be like i'll read that later i'll read that later and i'll be like cool uh yeah jen can you help respond to some fans cuz there's a lot of like fan mail in there now when i read that i'm like you know what these are ride or die fans that i can't like these, they're the reason that mm -hmm. I even care about doing the show is because they're still there. That's right. awesome. I just have to, it's like I just walked in with a cup full of little ball bearings and just spilled them all over the floor <laughs> and I can't see because it's dark and I'm trying to collect all of them. Like that's what I'm looking at right <laughs> now. It's like, where are those show fans? Because some of them aren't going to care. They're going to go, what happened to this Art of Charm feed? Nothing. There's no new shows. Or like, who are these ra random people doing it? And they're just going to not care. But there's thousands, tens of thousands, hopefully, or hundreds of thousands, even better, <laughs> of people that are like going to go back into iTunes or the, their podcast app and search for The Jordan Harbinger Show and go, oh, good, this is still going. And I've been getting notes from those people constantly, and it's really something that get, it literally gets me out of bed in the morning at this point. So since you're, you're a great person to ask a question like this too, because we have a lot of people that listen. I mean, fuck, since we've started, we must, we must know 10 or 15 fans that have created a podcast now and trying to build a cool. business. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we definitely have a lot of entrepreneurs and people very interested in, in this process. And you're a great guy who's, who's built something up to something as big as Art of Charm and is now literally starting over in a sense and doing that. What are some of the things when you look back now, uh, that you did really well in Art of Charm, and that you think you're, and then things that you're going to do differently now with the, with your building show. the show, right? Yes. Because uh, of course, if we get into everything business wise, I'm like, oh my god, we, we don't have enough time to list all my mistakes. Um, with the show, I got to tell you, man, I did hundreds of interviews where I was being interviewed by somebody else, and the first like. 30 to 50 taught me how to be interviewed by somebody else, which is an experience that I think is underrated. Mm -hmm. Dude, let's talk about that. Yeah. I think that's a big deal. Sal and I talk about this a lot because mm -hmm. we do a lot of individual interviews right now. And um, 
And it it's takes a, skill. It's a yeah, it's a different skill set. Talk about that. It's a different skill set. So a lot of people think, hey, I can just go on and be interviewed because I'm an expert in some subject matter area. But you all know people that are really good at something like a bodybuilder and then you get them in front of a microphone and they're like, um, you just have to like be consistent and work out yeah. every day and um, you know, make sure you're getting your macros in. Can't and tell like, a story. Good about. God, like get this guy out of here. <laughs> but that could be you. And even if you're interviewing people and having fun conversations on Mind Pump or the Jordan Harbinger show plug every single <laughs> every day, like you you don't necessarily know what it's like when somebody who's maybe unskilled you've been interviewed by somebody who's unskilled, right? And you're like, Oh my God. Yep. And then you have to carry it. Just, you have to run just the show. Take over the show. Yeah. yeah. So you have to but you have to build that skill set in that confidence to go oh, this person's done 10 podcasts. I've done 1,010. Right. I literally have to start being more entertaining now or people are going to tune out. And it's not their fault. They're inexperienced or whatever. Who cares? Right. Or you get another host that's talking over you and you're not telling your own story, which is probably what I'm doing to you guys right now. <laughs> no, 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 no. And like, and you've got to figure out how to, how to modulate that. So I look back and I think, okay, I, I, what I did right was I went on every show that I could and I learned how to be interviewed. But what I did wrong was I did it for years and there was a point at which I would be interviewed by somebody and I would freaking just phone it in, man, because I knew that it was going to, the show has 200 listeners and I would be like, all right, that means like 20 people are going to actually download and play this. So I would just be like checking my email and stuff. And I realized at the time, and I didn't even get it at the time, but now I'm like, what the hell was I even doing? You know, that was so stupid. So now when I'm redoing, when I'm restarting, I'm going to lean into the shows that that matter and have a lot of overlap. I'm still going to do smaller shows, of course, because I, I like that experience. But I'm going to make damn sure that I'm doing things that protect my sanity and my energy levels. Because there were days where I would do five or six interviews on other people's shows and I, I would look at the needle not move at all on the Art of Charm downloads. And now that I'm doing the Jordan Harbinger show, I'm just like, okay, I can't do volume. Right. I have to go on like the 50 to 100 shows in the next year or so that actually have audience that's going to go, oh, there's that Jordan guy. I used to listen to his show. He's got a new one. I have to do it that way and not just grind everything right. because I there were days where my wife was like, you're kind of being a dick. And I'm like, sorry, my voice hurts because I just did 40 shows last week and the total combined listenership of that was like less than one tweet from an influencer. <laughs> you know? Right, right. So you have to be careful with that. And there's there's countless things like that that I think I'm going to have to redo in in a different way. But it's hard to to your point earlier Sal like y you look at everything you did I look at everything I did for 11 years and I go, "Oh my god, I got to redo that." And you're like, "No, you're going to redo the stuff that worked." Mm -hmm. So I have to do a lot of 2020 hindsight, figure out what worked and remagnetize the audience to come find the new show, but also it's hard in your mind to go Hmm, out of the last 11 years, how much of that was like throw a spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks and develop skills and blah, 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 versus how much if we condense everything, we have a real plan and we're doing real stuff and the shows are really good. How long is that going to take? And I can't do that math in my head. And that's part of what's making me feel the overwhelm mm -hmm. is everyone goes, it's the unknown. It's the unknown. They're like, you're not going to take 11 years to build it up again. And I'm like, okay, but is it going to be six months or is it going to be six years? And, right. and that's, that scares the shit out of me yeah, right, right now. Right. It's know? always about the unknown. But So what I would say is focus on the known. You know being good on shows, making those contacts, you know, interviewing certain guests. You know they work. You just don't know. You're not going to know how much or how fast, but you know things that, that work. And you're also a black belt now. Like you've been doing this for a while. You're compelling on a podcast. We, I mean, we love having you on because it's going to be a great episode. And you're right. It's a skill. I mean, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from our guest. Joe DeSina was a guest that we had on. The guy's such a great storyteller. Yeah, After he, he left, is. I was like, okay, I totally am going to change the way I do interviews because that was compelling. And I know everybody that listened fucking loved listening to the guy. And you just end up building the skills. I want to talk about this, your show now, the, the Jordan Harbinger show plug. Uh, <laughs> what are you, now that you're free, okay, now you got your wings or you can spread your wings and do what the fuck you want, what are you going to do different? Yeah, it's an interesting situation because I never had to think about it until like very suddenly and very recently. So what I'm looking at is I still want to stay true to the core demographic of like 
intelligent conversation with high performers. I think that's very important. Um, and I, st- I do still love the whole like call bullshit on things when I don't like it and make people prove their points and things like that. But what I, what I'm looking forward to doing is not having to sell uh, products and, and training that have nothing to do with my interest and also that have nothing to do with my conversations because, uh, the show and the business really did grow apart in that I would have somebody on the show who's like a street preacher or a comedian who's breaking down nonverbal communication from stage and how he reads an audience or I'd have like Shaq on and then it's like oh by the way come to this thing where you learn dating and skills or whatever and it just it started to become more and more incong- incongruous with what I really wanted to do and and that always kind of weighed on me psychologically the other thing is the brand always had a little twinge of, I don't want to say embarrassment because it was something we built together, but it didn't make sense for me anymore. And I I was Mm -hmm. having a lot of problems booking certain caliber of guests because I would have to, I would have to say the name is the art of charm, but it's not about what you think. And And I would get rejected a lot from Mm -hmm. like, I remember Ashton Kutcher Mm -hmm. was like, I would love to do your show. And then his people were like, what's it called? Oh, uh, we looked at your website and we don't think it's a good fit. And I'm like, damn it, you mm, know. I hear what you're saying. So now I get really a chance to, like you said, spread my wings and do a lot of things differently. And so I get to. The exciting part is I really do get to keep everything that I really loved. Uh, unfortunately, aside from the audience, um, which I have to rebuild, but I get to keep the conversations. I get to keep delivering awesome stuff, and and I get to do it in a way that doesn't have this requirement that I like kind of plug stuff that I don't necessarily feel as much a part of Mm. anymore. So rather than thinking about, or excuse me, rather than the theme being charm or whatever in the name, it's interview show. It's like me interviewing people, really interesting people having great conversations. So you don't have to worry about that other. Yeah. I mean, what I want to do is pull wisdom out of amazing folks. I want to pull wisdom out of, um, like Adam Carolla and Dr. Drew. And I want to pull wisdom out of this guys that I had on the show before, like Shaquille O'Neal and general Stanley McChrystal. Like I love talking with those types of folks and I love delivering this, like these kernels of, th- of experience that they've just distilled into awesome ball, like sal- rock solid stuff and teaching that to the Jordan Harbinger show listener base, because that's making people better. That's making people better. Not like tips and tricks to, amp up your you know game or whatever like I don't I don't like that stuff and and I I'm glad that I don't have to do that and I'm glad that I get to sort of change direction and there's a lot there's a million little things that we get to do that probably make less sense to broadcast on here but like my producer's excited just about making different types of tweaks that that we probably wouldn't be able to do before but the branding really is the change that we're most excited about because we just had so much trouble and there were show fans that were like I can't tell my friends about this because they're just, they just get insulted when I tell them they need to listen to a podcast called The Art of Charm. And, and so now that I have the Jordan Harbinger show, I've been getting a lot of email that's like, hey, I can finally recommend this to tons of people that were totally not going to listen before. And that that's exciting and has me hopeful. Oh, that's really cool, man. <clears throat> well, well, shit, if I if like I told you earlier, if I could buy stock in you, I totally would, dude. I appreciate I, that, man. And I think you're, everybody around you that knows you way better than I do feels the same way. <laughs> So I that's good, it man. feels like it's really going to bring the passion out again. You know, now you can pursue uh, guests and certain people that you are actually interested in. And it's not like you're worried about like this fitting in with your brand and how that can all kind of uh, coordinate. But now people you're going to actually look out for, pursue and just extract all that awesome information from. Yeah. So, well, you, that sounds exciting. You know, so yeah. you do really well, Jordan. I'd love for you to kind of expand on it because I think this is something that you probably developed because I what I have not done, I've never gone back and listened to really old episodes of you. Yeah. I, I don't don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the the evolution of you as an interviewer. Because uh, that's a skill. A it is. A, skill. It's a major skill, and and a lot of people, even if you have a decent conversation, don't know how to pull those nuggets out of people. What are some of the things that you've learned over the course of your time on like how to how to have a great fucking deep conversation? Yeah. So the first thing that I recommend, and this this has nothing. This is not specific just to interviewing people. The first thing is that I've learned is vulnerability. And I know that sounds cliche, but I'll tell you how this works. Because even before I hit record on 
the Jordan Harbinger show or on any interview, before I hit record, I always say, hey, uh, Justin, how you doing? And the person's, you know, the guest is like, oh, you know, I'm good. How are you? And I'll actually tell them the truth. I'll say, yeah, actually, I woke up this morning and I had this weird stomach ache and I, I realized it was because I didn't eat dinner last night because I was worried about this thing. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I had a similar thing happen. And we'll get into a real conversation right wow. away because I'm not going, oh, how are you this morning? Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks fake, for coming fake, on. Fake, fake, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. fake. And then and then you say, so, Sal, where do you shop for clothes? And you're like, well, I'm glad you asked me that, right? Like, it's it, <laughs> it just turns into a fake interview. But if I start off by saying man, you know, what did you eat for breakfast? And they go, oh, uh, you know, I didn't eat breakfast. And I go, is that a normal thing for you? And they go, no, I just was in a hurry and I feel a little hungry. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I always feel like crap when I don't eat. We'll just go down that road. And then when I say, so when you were in the trenches, literally in Afghanistan and Iraq, you can't eat whenever you want. There must've been days that went by where you didn't get food. And I remember having this conversation with General McChrystal and he was like, I ate one meal a day if I was lucky. And I said, what was that by design or what? And he's like, no, you got to let your troops eat first and you can't be eating hot soup and bacon in front of them when they haven't eaten in 17 hours and they're eating an MRE maybe if they're lucky in three hours if we don't get shelled or what. And I'm like, this is the beginning of a real conversation. So if you can avoid pleasantries and just get into it, you can cut off the beginning where you're talking about breakfast and then suddenly you're already in the middle of a real conversation. When I first started interviewing, and having conversations with people on the podcast, I didn't do that. So when I go back and listen brutally, b- brutally painful to old, old, old episodes of The Art of Charm before, you know, like f- from years ago, the first half of the show is effing fluff, man. It's yeah. just garbage. That's and what we run into. It's sound bites from the guests who are like, in my new book, Paleo Superstar, <laughs> I have on page 73, and you guys are just like probably going, this is our own fucking fault. Yep. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so we let him down the path and now he's just doing it. He's phoning it in. These are the sound bites. So I spent a lot of time trying to work through the soundbite thing by exhausting the guest and letting them go through their sound bites and then getting into real conversation. And I found that in real life, as well as in interviews, if you just start off by saying, here's what's going on, people will drop all the crap. Like when I walked in the door here, you guys said, Hey, what's going on, man? You guys had heard a little through the texting and everything, but what I didn't say, I'm great. What about you? I said, Oh man, this is some real shit. And then we just immediately started talking about it. We didn't have to spend 20 minutes. So how's, how's the new car? How's the wife? Oh, you bought a house. That's exciting. Like we didn't do any of that shit right? because it it doesn't have any value. It's not real. It's not real. Something that I found that's, that we are getting better at that was really difficult at first was when we have a guest and we disagree with them or we want to call them out on their bullshit, but we refrain from doing it because it's this weird like, you know, when you have a guest in your home and you want to be polite, so you have that same kind of feeling and we're- You don't want to offend somebody. We're starting yeah. to get to the point now where, we've, where we're where we like, well, fuck that. We're interviewing the person. This is something that my listeners are thinking and I'm thinking it too, Like, but it's hard. Like, How do you get through that and- Maybe give, can you give us an example of a time where you were just calling someone out and it turned into or like, yeah or scared to ask a question or or call someone out on like a big name person you know yeah it happens a lot and I'm trying to think of an example but I'm I'm drawing a blank right now but I, I'll tell you yes there's been tons of times where somebody would say something and the person's like your friend and or they're a well known person in their field and you're going oh shit what do I do right now and I I realized that and it took me probably ten years to realize this too my duty is to the person who is listening. Mm. And so if somebody comes in and goes, if you buy my water bottle, I'll send a bottle of our herbal weight loss stuff for free. And like, you might be like, oh, this person's a guest on my show. No, the people listening, they fucking trust me to not lead them down a path of bullshit. And they trust you guys to do the same thing. So if, if somebody comes on and says something and you know it to be not true, your choice should not be, hmm, this is going to be a little disrespectful to this person and they're standing in front of me. No, there's 150,000 people or whatever who are standing in front of you virtually going, oh, well, Adam didn't say that that was a bunch of crap, so maybe they're into it. So maybe it's like a tacit endorsement or something like that. So you have to say no. You have to go, wait a minute. I don't know if that's real. Or you go, wait a minute. You have an herbal weight loss thing? Come on, man. What's the deal? And 
even worst case scenario, and this has never happened, they could go, how dare you? And they could get up and leave and your audience will go, damn right. Call <laughs> that motherfucker out on that, I got right? you. And yeah, and, and they'll appreciate you for it. But I'll tell you what has happened. If there was, oh, here's a, an example. My friend Christine, Christine Hassler, she's a great person, uh, awesome sort of therapist and coach. And she said something on my show years ago, and I'm picking on her because I love her and I know she won't get too mad. She said something like, well, well, you know, everything is energy, right? And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> if you mean in like that physics dictate that, I don't know, it's like there's a formula that shows that matter is potential energy. If that's what you mean, then sure, maybe, but I'm not a physicist. But if you're talking about like the universe provides and the energy that flows throughout the, the everything, no, then I'm like, no. That, no, if it can't be measured on a machine, <laughs> there's no energy here. You know, what are you talking about? And I made her explain it. She's like, oh, I should have known better than to say something like that in front of you. And that's what people expect. Because that's what they're thinking. That's they're what they're th thinking. They're thinking yeah. the same that we just had an interview just last week with Aubrey Marcus. I don't know if you know who Yeah, Aubrey I Marcus love Aubrey. Is. I just talked to him yesterday. Right. I love so, that guy. And we were interviewing him, and I, the first half hour was exactly what we just gave an example of. He's plugging his book. A lot of surface bullshit. All the questions I was asking him, very canned answers. And then it finally, it takes about 45 minutes. So I just get tired of it. And I just call, start calling it like, really, bro, you're in an open relationship. And you mean to tell me you, you and you work with a bunch of beautiful other women. Your girl doesn't ever get fucking jealous that you might be fucking your secretary. Right. Like, come on, dude. Like, you can't tell me that bullshit. And so... And then and, the interview changed and yeah. it became way more entertaining. And yeah, more right. of course. But it's it's kind of scary. We, I, I, I'll be the first. We interviewed him over a year and a half ago, and we were nowhere near the size. It was a big deal that we were in their house and we were interviewing. So I remember not, not being afraid to do that. And I, and I remember telling myself going to this interview, like, don't let this happen, Adam. Don't. And I remember listening. We come right out the gates. Sal kind of asked him a generic question about his book and stuff like that. And I'm like, fuck. Here we go. Here we go. Here yeah. we go again. And I'm like, no, and I'm in my head. I'm listening to the answers. I'm like, I am not going to let this happen. Right. Like, as, as soon as I have an opening right here, I'm going to call some bullshit out. And then, and then, then the interview turned really good. So, I mean, it's definitely an art, and it's one that I think even ourselves we're getting better at that yeah, that skill set. Playing. And I think what you said is so true. Our loyalty doesn't lie in this per the one person that's sitting in front of us. My loyal, my real loyalty is like you said, the hundreds of thousands that are listening. Those are the fucking people that I should be more concerned about. And that's such a great, and I will use that now that you've said that. I'll go into interviews thinking, yes. like, you know what? I want to hire you for as a podcast coach. Yeah. Has anybody I, ever I am that? recently available. <laughs> go figure. I'm available to do that. <laughs> that's, that. There might be a market for that, actually. I'm sure that there is. Uh, I just don't know if I have to create it or if people are like, wait a minute, I hadn't thought about that. I have coaches for interviews. I still work with coaches for interviews. Do they, you really? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and it, they're hard to find because uh, I'll, I had this uh, interview coach named Steve Couch. He's a Canadian broadcaster, uh, and he was awesome. And then after, I don't know, we worked together for like a year, he told Jason, my producer Jason and I, he goes, hey, uh, this is not really a good sales job that I'm going to do here, but I can't really teach you guys much more, so I'm not going to keep taking your money because you've done everything that I've suggested and you're doing it well. And I was like... Thanks, that's high praise, but crap, now we don't have a coach. So I reach out to uh, this this guy named Frank Cesno, uh, and he's works at CNN, and he's a journalism professor, and I have a dialogue going back and forth with him. And there's other people in my pipeline that are like the, the talk show host coach for NPR. And I'm like, look, I don't work for NPR, but are you available? And she's like, I haven't really done this, but I would consider it. If you want to come to one of my workshops, maybe I can like ask NPR if you can just join us or something. So you have to create those opportunities at this level. I feel like I have to create those opportunities because whenever I ask professional journalists for help, often they'll just listen to the show and they'll go, Oh no, you're fine. And I'm like, no, I don't want to hear that. I'm fine. I want to learn something or they'll go, Oh yeah. You know, you might want to work on just story arcing. And I'm like, okay, that sounds like a weeks of work that I don't know how to do. Somebody's got to teach me this stuff. It's, it's like when you're working out and you're doing the fitness stuff, if you're doing like fitness physique modeling or something, you don't ever probably look at yourself and go, shit, I'm perfect. I got nothing to do. <laughs> what am I even going to do today? Adam, Adam does that. Yeah. <laughs> he, does, yeah. he might. He might. I do not. No, absolutely. That's uh, your, your no, critiquing, you're right. critiquing the fuck out of yourself. You're right. For sure. No, it's uh, it's such a it's such a fucking skill. And I I don't I mean, we, we practice by doing it, but we sh we have yet to hire somebody 
to coach us and help us, and I think that's absolutely brilliant. I don't know why we didn't really ever. Well, I think when you're when you're self aware, if you if you recognize that about, I mean, we're I think we're all super critical of ourselves. I think we all recognize even when we turn the podcast on that you know these three assholes have no experience podcasting. I would be a fool to think that I'm going to be fucking great right out the gate. But what I do have is the ability to continue to grow and learn. And I, when I listen to a podcast like yours. I, it's funny. I I don't listen to it probably like a normal listener. A normal listener listens to it and they're like interested in the guests. And right. stuff. Like yeah. I don't give a fuck about that. Like I'm actually matter. paying attention to the the way the conversation flows, how you direct the guest. That's what I'm paying attention to. So in a sense, you are kind of coaching me or giving giving advice that way by paying attention to that. And I and I this is the same advice that I give to younger people that are getting involved in this and they want to learn as a listen there's some really good talented people out there that do interviews listen to the way they interview and pay attention to how they evolve that because mm-hmm. i think there's there's plenty of that within a, within a good podcast so with with the art of charm one of the ways you guys monetize is you guys had an academy or whatever right where yeah. people attend and i'm assuming now you don't have that anymore how have you thought about how you're going to monetize besides sponsorships sure yeah the jordan harbinger show will be monetized with of course sponsorships that's naturally one of the things that that was easiest for us i don't like having too many ads of course but I, I do have to keep the lights on and pay the team. Even if I live off my own sort of savings for the, the year while we rebuild, I can't expect the same of my my team. Right. So I'm going to monetize that way. We're definitely going to be branching into... So, well, it, it depends on what shakes out with the split, right? Because there's going to be some sort of non-compete, I would imagine, mm-hmm. because... I, it's hard, I don't even want to speculate because I feel like that's improper. Sure, but there's sure. going to be something where I, I have to design whatever income we have around whatever is of course agreeable or mm-hmm. agreed to by the particular split but there's always things that you can do i i'm not as interested i'm not at all interested frankly in live training per se because it's super time consuming it requires a sales team you've got to get people to fly out to you or you've got to run events elsewhere it's not that i won't ever have events or that i won't participate in events but having i'm certainly not going to have a week long you know residential program or anything like that and I will be teaching courses online uh, in areas that I find myself to be qualified to teach. Uh, and I will also be held, having hopefully some show guests and things like that also co-creating, collaborating on content as well. Because if we can get these guests in the door, it's kind of senseless not to try to do more with them if the audience is really going for bananas sure. over the content. Right. Absolutely. For sure. Um so how are you handling the stress of it right now? Because when you came in, you talked about like not couldn't sleeping. sleep and like what do you do? Do you have a strategy? What are you doing? Because that that will. I, I mean, I I told you off air that I went through a divorce while we were. I mean, while we were started mar- mind pump, I went through a divorce after 15 years of marriage, and I quickly learned that if I didn't put things in place to handle the baseline stress, nothing else would work. It was like I needed the baseline. You know, it's like I needed food and you need food and water if you're going to do this other stuff. Like no matter what you're going to do, you need these baseline things. Do you have a strategy or you're looking at, you know, things you can start to. Yeah, I, I do have a strategy, but it's also not necessarily working that great. uh, Or at least it's not complete. I should say it's working, but it's not complete. I've never had the level of anxiety that I'm dealing with now. I, I'm totally unfamiliar with it. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about compassion. When people say, before when somebody said, yeah, you know, I deal with anxiety. Or people will write in and say, I have crippling anxiety. I'm like, okay, you're shy. I get it. And now I'm like, <laughs> now I'm like, wait a minute. If, the, if this person means that they feel the way I felt this morning when I woke up, Holy fuck. Man, holy shit. I feel so bad for that guy. Mm-hmm. I want to give him a hug, man, because it's that's a terrible feeling. You feel like your mind is racing. You got a weird thing going on in your stomach. You can't sleep. You're torturing yourself. There's don't emotional stuff. Yeah. You don't want to eat. Yeah, you don't want to eat. I'm outside walking to get sun and burn off a little bit of nervous energy, but like... You know, I'll see like a bird or something that like looks injured and I'm like, I'm like, oh crap, am I about to cry right now? Like, what the <laughs> fuck? And it's so weird because you yeah. feel like a crazy person, man. Is there nothing in your life that you can even come close to comparing to the feeling you're going through right now? Do you, can you reach back and think like, man, I remember this one time that I went to this or is this that this, crazy different? This is the crazy unknown anxiety. This is, I can't think of anything that compares to this. Now that said, this is like, as far as, other people's problems go. This is like people, even my producer's like, bro, you got to snap the fuck out of it, right? Because he's got like, I, I don't have a, I didn't, I don't have a death in the family. I'm healthy. 
Uh, if yeah, I, but don't don't you know don't I mean? lessen what you're feeling, man. It's okay. Yeah. Like it's okay to say like this fucking sucks. It's that's what you're feeling right now. And you know, if you compare it to other people, that will start to. What happens? You end up adding a layer on top of it because now you feel bad for feeling bad. Yeah. Now you're judging like, wow, I'm fucking stressed out and anxious, but I shouldn't be because I didn't have a death in the family. I don't have cancer. I don't, don't do that because now you've got to go through some more layers. Like you feel what you feel. That's all. Yeah. It fucking suck. Well, you got to yeah. understand that we we spend years building up and protecting this ego of ours by becoming more successful and people knowing who we are and you build it, build it, build it, build it, build it. And then all of a sudden something like this happens and it's never been challenged at this level. It's never been challenged at this level. And you got to ask yourself like what, what's going on here? Because you really aren't sick. You haven't been hurt. You haven't had a death. And is it that I'm identifying with this this false thing that's not even real like it's these aren't tangible things yeah. it's this it's this false ego that we've built up and it is you're not you're not injured you can still go back to work you still can build something you could do some greater things so what is it that really causes us to be this way and i i always try and reflect on like this is me man like i shouldn't be i last night i just got into it with my girl like we were and i was really hard on her it's just not like me to be like this and you know I do. I do have the whereabouts that right after the conversation, I apologize and I said, "I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got upset at you like that because it's not you. It's totally me. Like yeah. this is because I would never talk to you like that. Or I. Ne- I mean, you're my. You're my rock. You're my world. Everything that where we're at right now is because of you. I, I respect you so much. See, and- now I'm like about. To, I'm like getting emotional. I'm. Fu- I'm not kidding. This shit happens to me like all right, day. Right. And I know what it is. I've got to like get it out. But my body's like what are you doing? There's a liquid forming around your eye. Right. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. And then I'm like, oh, think of something else. Right. Yeah, you know? Exactly. And yeah. it's, it's happening though. Like I have this thing, I, I'm Make telling you right now, and I didn't mean to stop your story, no, but no. I'll tell you right now, I'm going to be in a movie theater and I'm going to see a commercial where it's like, adopt a pet. And I'm going to be like, I got to go. Right. <laughs> and I'm going to lose my shit. It's Bro, only a matter of time. You should have seen the text that, I was, sending, that I was sending these guys while I was going through my divorce oh, or doing mind pump. And it wasn't, my texts weren't, Hey, I feel terrible. Feel bad for me. I feel so sorry for me. It was like, hey man, I apologize. I'm like 20% of my normal capacity. I love you guys. Thanks for having my back. It is, and looking back, I, it, it's a superpower. We have, humans have the ability to empathize way differently than other animals do on a whole different level. It is a superpower. It is extremely valuable. And what you're doing is you're tapping into it, and it, it is something that's valuable. And right now, you're just overwhelmed with it. Yeah. But moving forward, it will make you. It has made me a totally different and better human being, and that's what it's going to make you. And you're just tapping into something that was always there. You just didn't. You it just was didn't under really a stone freaking cap, though, man. That's it, I, dude. You know, that's it. That's absolutely. It. What's crazy is how we could how it could spiral down though if you don't get your hands on it, right? Bro. If you don't, or if you're not aware of it, it could turn into this very toxic thing where you then start like like how I felt. Like I I allowed outside stresses, something that had nothing really to do with her, to affect our conversation when it's like, fuck, this is not your fault. If anything, you're part of the reason why I'm here where I'm yeah. at right now, but yet I'm putting it on you right now, but it's really not you falling short of something. This is me and my insecurities that I'm dealing with myself right now because I have these expectations of where we should be in the business, what should be happening, what should be going on, and I'm putting that on you. And there was this like moment that I had that I was like, fuck, dude, I'm a piece of shit right now. Like, I can't <laughs> believe I did that. <laughs> oh, and I man. did. You're just I, human, man. No, and I, but you know, and it's a testament to also the, uh, the incredible relationship and partnership that I have with Katrina because, you know, we kind of just went boom our separate ways for the night, you know, and she's like, I, I can't talk to you. I literally made her cry. It was so bad. Oh, man. And, and she kind of went her separate way and then I kind of sat there uh, in my own like, and I'm sitting there and I'm like kind of angry and stuff. And it wasn't, and, I, and I'm like, I'm not really angry. How can I be angry at her? Everything that she's done. It's not her. This is me and what I'm dealing. With. So I'm just sitting there kind of processing like why I feel this way. And when I really unpack all of it, it's all my ego and it's all my own insecurities. It's mm-hmm. that, I expect for me to be at a certain time, place right here. I, w- I thought we'd be more successful than this. I thought this would be accomplished. I thought this would have been done by now. And it's all things that I'm really upset about myself and, I, and I'm projecting that on her. And at that moment, I felt that and I walked upstairs and I just, you know, I h- held her and said, you know, I'm sorry. Like, I'm, I apologize. Like, I love you. Like, this isn't you. This is 100% me. And she right away, she goes, I know, hon, I love you too. And I know that. So I think that's, that to me is is the is the important piece when you go through these things is it's very very difficult 
to pull yourself out and then try and look at like your, your emotions, your feelings, and your reactions that you're having, and then and then really try and validate them mm-hmm. for like is, is this really is this true what I'm what I'm starting to yeah. conjure up in my mind like or is it not really that this isn't reality and, like and before you get there you have to let yourself be there like you talked about crippling anxiety or cripple it's it literally is like you, you'll you'll it's being terrified. But there's nothing in front of you to be terrified. Like yeah. imagine how you how you would feel if you knew you were about to cross uh, a murky river with alligators in it, but you had to cross it. Now imagine that feeling. That's what people feel when they feel crippling anxiety. Except it's general, and it's maybe there's not a specific thing, but like what the fuck? I feel ter- I can't even get up to brush my teeth because I feel so scared. Yeah, yeah. I I don't have. I thank God it's not at that level, but it's it's some nights it's damn close. Where I'll just be like, I, I I was laying in bed the other day and my Apple Watch was like breathe, and I was like, oh that pops up when you're like you know not your heart rate too high. So I, I was like, I'll check my heart rate. One thirteen. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about anything. I didn't Fuck. wake up from a nightmare. I was laying down, and I wasn't watching the news. Nothing. And I was just like, that's weird. I'm not sleepy. And that was just like, oh, shit. You know, this this sort of like fight or flight thing is happening. And, it, and to your earlier point about ego, it, it's it's not ego as in like arrogant, like, oh, shit, now no. people don't think I'm cool. It's what it, what it is is I look and I go, wow, I've had like a thousand shows and or more probably. And I built this back catalog and I built it over years and all that had this big audience of people that were listening to me. And now I have to start over. Have I lost a part of myself, you know, because I was so attached to that. And I'm like, this is one of those. It's almost like a Zen thing where it's like, oh, is this you? Are you your work? (laughs) Is your body of work you uh, or is it something that you take with you? And if so, then maybe you need to like feel that in a way that's more unique to you. Cause right now um, you were talking about looking at the mountain and trying to reset and everything. I'm and your friend who was the, the fitness competitor. I know exactly what she's feeling because, and, and as guys, I think we're probably even worse with this stuff. We go crap. I was building from level 10, trying to get to level 11. Now I'm at level one and I want to build to level 11. And it's like, no, you literally have to. So I'm looking at this mountain thinking it doesn't thinking the race doesn't even start until I'm back to where I was. Exactly. And then I've got to keep going. And that is that's fucking overwhelming, man. Right. Instead of just trying to build it piece by piece and do this new thing and do it right and do it different and keep going and doing what I do best. I'm thinking like I'm thinking subconsciously. I have to literally rebuild everything that I did over 11 years before I mm. before I matter again. Oh, have so, you have you snapped on anybody yet? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Is that a thing that happens? Well, so this is, <laughs> I think everybody's no, different. No, exactly. I okay. think I think there's I think there's really two types of people that get in these stressful positions and I actually think if you're not the person that snaps I I, I actually am more concerned because the other type is the type the type that will hole up and get quiet and depressed and go and bury That's it all. That's probably time. me, yeah. Right. Although I haven't experienced that either. Right. Like there tends to be like this. I either have been you're either the type of person where all this pressure, stress, and then you lash out, which is I think someone like me. I project it onto somebody else, and then that opens my eyes. And oh like, yeah, no, I do that. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jen. No, yeah, my wife's like, what are you talking about? Of course you do that. Right. No, right. I do that. Yeah. So <laughs> that's I think that's the thing that you you just got to be aware of those those moments because those are probably either already happening or going to happen and then where the spiraling down happens is you can really start to damage all those that are around you that really are your part of your support system right. well look, look at it this way if you knew right now that you were about to go climb a literal physical mountain and it's something you've never done before or whatever it's something new it's just a big physical challenge okay i got i got a 30 mile or 40 mile climb on this mountain uh I need to prepare for that or I need to strengthen myself to be able to do that. Think of it this way. You are going through some new challenges, a lot of uncertainty, some chaos going on. You're admittedly saying you're going through crazy amounts of stress. Create a strategy to strengthen yourself or take care of yourself because if you go hard enough, as, as, as well-intentioned as you are, if you lose enough sleep, if you don't feed yourself properly and you don't make that something that becomes a priority, like I need to take care of myself because I can't handle this shit, if my body starts to fail me, if you don't do that and your body starts to fail, then it becomes almost impossible. Yeah. So that's why I ask you, like, what are the things, are there things 
that you're doing or maybe we can talk about? Yeah, let's talk about it. Okay, so here's what I got. that Because I figured out early that self-care was going to be huge because I was like staying up all night and talking with people on the phone or like... I mean, trying to like have a couple drinks to like wind down and that didn't work because I was so wound up. So then I was like, oh, I need to like drink the whole bottle of wine, but I don't like doing that. And then my wife was like, no, you're not drinking yourself to sleep, you <laughs> idiot. And I'm like, I don't even want to do that. Right. So I would start doing, but I would start doing other stuff like, like just unhealthy stuff and it, not even, not even worth mentioning really. But I started to, to then eat right. And I always loved walking and I make my phone calls when I walk and I do the audiobooks in preparation for shows when I'm walking. And I, I looked at my Steps app the past like couple of weeks. I've walked like a hundred miles and I'm not exaggerating. I Holy mean, shit. normally I try to do like 10,000 steps a day and it now is like 35,000 steps. Holy shit, you are moving around. I'm moving around. Awesome. And, and I've, I've lost 30 pounds, not in the last month, thank God. That would be really bad. But in the past probably year, I've lost 30 you look pounds. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm definitely losing more weight recently because of the fact that I'm walking so much and I'm my appetite ain't what it used to be so I'm doing like green juice in the morning because uh, I'm waking up so hungry which is unusual for me usually I skip breakfast but I am dying by like 8 or 9 a.m. probably because I'm waking up at like 4 um, you're also burning a lot of calories too though and I'm burning a lot of calories yeah. I hadn't thought about that yeah I'm burning a lot of calories uh, and I'm also eating a lot of like home cooked food instead of going out to eat because mm -hmm. I, I started to realize that any even a healthy restaurant, they have to make that shit taste good. So they're <laughs> gonna put butter in there or they're gonna put a lot of salt in there or something. So I just go to my in law's house to eat, which is really close. And and this is why this is important. It sounds lazy to go to your in-law's house to eat every single day, but I'll, getting out of my house, because I work from home and I walk around my neighborhood, getting out of my house to go eat dinner at a place where I don't have my computer, there is no work, and my mother-in-law is going to like cover me with a blanket and my father-in-law is going to just make like really good Chinese food and sit there and feed me <laughs> vegetables, basically. Like, oh, eat this, eat this. You know, that, that, that having other people take care of you like that is great. And it's easy on me. It's easy on my wife. And so the other thing that we're adding to this is uh, I have a gym membership. The gym is right across the street. It's a, it's a big box gym, but it's still there. It's right there. And I'm like, hey, Jen, uh, to my wife, I'm like, hey, Jen, why don't we just, since we're up at 6 a.m. fretting or like checking email, why don't you just sign up for the gym? We'll just go over there every morning and do like a light workout to get the blood flowing because I noticed that when I go to the gym, the rest of the day, I'm like, I can do this. What was I even upset about? But then the next day, I'm like, shit, my life is over, right? So I just need to keep doing it. Yes. I, I of everyone knows that working out makes you feel good. This is different. This is like working out is keeping me sane. It's and totally, that's different. It's totally different. I had a, a family member about six years ago who I'm very close with got diagnosed with uh, uh, terminal cancer. Oh man. Went through a year and a half process and I had always worked out. I had worked out for years. You know, I I've been lifting weights since I was fourteen years old or training since I was fourteen. And my goals were no longer at that at that time weren't that wasn't trying to build muscle. I wasn't trying to get stronger. I wasn't trying to improve my performance. It was literally I am taking care of myself right now. And it was a different attitude when I went in the gym. I unplugged everything, did my training, went in my zone, and it wasn't to improve my fitness. It was just to to keep myself healthy, and it fucking worked. Like of everybody around that situation, I stayed the healthiest, and I, that's a hundred percent one of the, one of the reasons. The other thing that I found which I recently discovered through my divorce, was nature. And what I mean by nature is not just every once in a while going on a hike. It was literally, let's go somewhere where there's no one and nothing, take my shoes and socks off, and feel the dirt or feel the sand and schedule it. Like make it a regular weekly thing that I do. Hmm. And if I can, make it a daily thing. And boy, did that make it because there's, you know, when you're out in nature, you, you, you don't, if you don't have reception or you leave your phone in the car, there's nothing, there's no one. It's I feel quiet, like it's, I, I it feel like it's less of the nature and it's more about learning how to just completely be alone with yourself. It is, but it's, it's, how it's awful, changing it, the, it have to change the scenery because right, it's right. so hard to do yeah, that. I know, I agree. It's with. possibly that. It's also being small, you know? Yeah. Like, and for me, it, for me, it's definitely because I live in the redwoods and the redwoods are just so like, grandiose they're huge and you look up and you just you just have this different perspective about it there's something to it i mean it, it's somewhat like mystical or like woo woo whatever 
But just being able to kind of look around and understand how small you are in the world, it, it really impacts you in a different way. It's just mm-hmm. it's detachment. And per, it's detachment and perspective. We we live in this world now where we're so fucking plugged in. We have distractions around us all the time. People have a hard time having a conversation without being on their fucking phones together in front of each other. It's like you're so disconnected from yourself. It's so crazy. Mm-hmm. And I think walking on a beach or going up in the redwoods or doing these things like that. I think the real magic behind the woo-woo-ness of it is simply that is, you know, how often do you honestly just sit alone in silence by yourself or just really be, when do you do that? You just, we just don't do that that and, often And it's anymore. great when you're in nature because it's, it's the awe of it and it's a different environment. I'm always in the city. I'm always in, you know, or my house or at work. So I changed environments and I started doing that and it was just incredible spending time with people who are important to you. That was another one that was extremely powerful for me. Avoiding uh, processed foods always, because even when I feel good, if I eat processed foods, I notice a higher level of stress. Huh. Mm. So that was, it just, and it's mainly because it's of- Inflammation. Yeah, inflammation goes up from processed foods, which means cortisol goes up because cortisol is in response to inflammation. Your cortisol is already fucking high because yeah. you're stressed. So you're just amping everything up. And so the way I looked at my diet and exercise was- I have to be more perfect with these controllables yeah. so that I can handle more of these uncontrollables better. Like all here's all my controllables. I'm just going to really clamp down on those and dial those in because so I can make myself more resilient. And then the other thing was, I don't you're a big reader. Yeah. And usually when I read books, it's books that are informational, that are, you know, that are nonfiction, that are very what dense, I, yeah. Very dense. What I did was is I started to so one book, I don't know, are you familiar with Eckhart Tolle? Yeah, of okay. course. So A New Earth. Great book. I listened to that and he, he talks all about the ego on that and it really helped me separate things and stop identifying with certain things and it helped me move forward. That was another thing that I went through. But you have all these controllables that you know. Like if you dial those in, man, you'll make yourself so much more bulletproof with all this other, because there's already, look, what you're going through, a lot, like there's a lot of, uh, uh, uncontrollables. There's a lot of chaos. Yes. That's the stress. Jordan, have you fucked with a float tank yet? A long time ago I did, and I was like, oh, it didn't work. <laughs> and then my my friends were like, oh, really? It didn't work. I, you know, for me, it was really good. And I was like, yeah, I just kept hearing um, toilets flushing across the street, and I kept <laughs> hearing like all of these different things in the float tank. And the, the guy who was working there, who was the owner, was like, no, you you definitely didn't hear anything. Those are like auditory hallucinations. And I was and I was like, <laughs> oh, shit. oh shit, I guess it worked, but I was my mind was going through some thing where I was literally like, no, I could hear people talking and I could and he he's like, I bet if you hear those heard those people talking again and you really zoomed in on it and you, you'd realize it's like your, you know, your dead grandmother or something. <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, that's totally terrifying." Yeah. <laughs> but he's like, "No, for real though, like it's going to be like you you talking to your mom as a child because he's like, if you stay in that float tank for 60 minutes, there's no there's nothing. You can't hear, see at anything, right. your brain just starts to do weird stuff. And it's like people in solitary confinement and stuff, how they have these weird like mental and emotional things happening. You start to get a little tiny bit of that, which hopefully is a benefit in a flow tank. But uh, It's yeah. cool. So, your brain just creates it. It has to create its own reality. Have, have you gone to the one over here in Campbell? Have you been to that? I haven't. I saw that, though. It looks really cool. Yeah. Have you guys been there? Yeah, yeah. We have oh, a few yeah. times. Oh, yeah. me, me, we, we went in there for two hours. Yeah, I did wow. a two-hour session, which was kind of cool. Um are you taking any adaptogenic herbs or things that have been, you know, because there are certain herbs that have been been used for thousands of years. Chinese and uh, Ayurvedic medicine uh, has some have some really good, uh, you know, advice in regards to allowing the body or helping the body handle stress. That's what adaptogens do. Is are you going to get them on that Four Sigmatic Chaga right now? Is uh, that well, no, I mean, they are one of our sponsors. <laughs> right. I wasn't, even, right. I wasn't even going to mention them, actually. Um, I wasn't even trying to do a plug, um, but- you Don't can, worry, I got it. You could try ash, <laughs> ashwagandha. is a very, very uh, good adaptogenic herb. Um, it's actually got clinical science to support how it helps the body handle stress. Um, so that's a good one. It's not acute, so it's not like you take it and you notice right away. Some people say that. They do. But really, if you take it every day after about four or five days, you'll notice you just have a lower level of stress. Okay. Or at least your body doesn't feel so amped. And then for acute stress, you can try passion flower. And passion flower is not to be used super, super regularly, um, but more when you have kind of that acute, like you did the other day when you were laying down and you noticed yeah. your heart rate was well high. Passion flower increases GABA 
in the brain, which is a inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's the thing that goes up when you drink alcohol or when you smoke pot, except it's not nearly that powerful. It's much more subtle, and it doesn't have uh, those other side effects. So those are the two things I would recommend. So passion flower for acute, ashwagandha regularly, and then you do the exercise diet stuff, and, and, and then hopefully that'll help you with your sleep because I think your sleep is just – that's really a side effect of everything else. If you yeah. start to handle some things, and you some, might be able some to granddaddy that. purple or OG Kush should help that too. <laughs> yeah, you, you know it's funny because I I am so not a marijuana guy, and like we live in California, we're in NorCal. Everyone's like, dude, just get the buds out and blah blah blah. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine has fibromyalgia, and he it's it's funny because I talk to him and I go, that's funny. I thought crippling anxiety was for people who were kind of just maybe crazy. And he's like, yeah, I thought fibromyalgia was for people who had like psychosomatic disorder. And he's like, so we both have these like things that we didn't think were real. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. the only thing that works, he's like, people keep telling me to smoke pot. And and so he, he started to uh, experiment a little with, with edibles and stuff. And he was like, try it. I'm like, come on, man. He's like, no, it's the only thing that works. So now I'm going from, I mean, I'm not smoking J's all the time or anything. I got to protect my voice. But <laughs> I I went to uh, a dispensary and I grabbed some CBD like chews. And I'm like, all right, I'll try this. Because at worst case, it's just like some non-psychoactive CBD with a little bit of sugar and chocolate. I'll give it a shot. Is it the Chiba Chews, the purple one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's good shit. You're probably going to the same place I go to. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Down in, uh, well, whatever. <laughs> but uh, We're not sponsored by you. We're not going to mention you. <laughs> yes, exactly. That oh, one. is it that place? Yeah, yeah. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's that place. We know, we know where We'll go is. there afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're all going <laughs> to we'll make a field trip. trip. So I'm like, okay, you know, these aren't cheap, but I'm like, how much is it worth for me to get a good night's sleep and just relax? And it's like, you know, this is not a chemical compound that's manufactured by Pfizer. Right. This yeah. is something that some dude grew right around here and baked it into a little brownie and it doesn't have a psychoactive effect. So I'm not like, hey guys, what's going on, yeah. man? Right. It's just this lower level of- Does it work for you? It, it does. And I'll tell you, it's weird because I before I thought this doesn't really do anything, now I realize it because if I think of something now, some some sort of stressful thing, I, I could feel like my heart do this thing where there's like an adrenaline. It feels uh. like it's taking a bath in adrenaline or something like that. And it'll happen all the time. And I'll do a little bit of the chews or I'll go to the gym and then like, you know, if I do really good self-care routine that day, I'll think of something a little stressful and it'll, it'll be like more mild or it'll be like, nah, whatever. But if I'm really high strung, I'll think of a thing or I'll see an email coming and I'll be like, oh, oh my God, oh my God. You know, and I, I realize wow, if I can minimize that chest crap that's going on that affects my eating, sleeping, da 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 the days on which I wake up and I've had a full night's rest are I am a totally different person mm -hmm. than if I've had half a night's rest. And if I haven't slept the night before, Jen, I feel bad for her, and I don't mean to embarrass her, but she will literally almost start crying in the morning because she just knows the whole day is going to be a shit piece of just a shit show yeah when i was a when i was a young trainer and i was training clients that were in their you know 30 40 50 years old successful businessmen and women i would like hammer home like the the programming and the cardio and the macros and your diet and everything like that fast forward 15 years later how long i've been doing this and all the hundreds and potentially thousands of people that i've trained that are like that my advice is so different now it's like sun water walk sleep that's, chew, yeah. chew so I'm doing food, it. I'm doing breathe. it. Yeah. I'm doing it right. The except for the sleep part. Yeah, I mean, those are like yep. like literally like master those four. Then get back to me, and we can get it. We'll get crazy about macros and shit. Sun, water, walking, and sleep. And sleep. And right. sleep. Those are the most the, important. And, they're the and, biggest rocks. And they're breathe. the biggest rocks. And breathing. So so two things. This is very important now. Breathing is a uh, involves a lot of muscles. So when you breathe in and you breathe out, there's muscles that are involved that allow you to do that, and you develop recruitment patterns with uh, every time you take a breath. Now, a pattern is something that can become your your default pattern. For example, when you walk, you don't think about how you walk, but muscles fire in a particular way, and you have a unique pattern to how you walk versus somebody else who says, who say is taller or maybe wore, always wore high heels or whatever, right? You have this pattern. You don't have to think about it. When you're stressed out, you change the way you breathe, and if you don't stop that patterning, it will become your new default pattern. And here's the second oh, man. and here's the second part to it. 
stress is, uh, is a, an anxiety are part of what's called a positive feedback loop. So let me explain what that means. That, so there's, but it sounds so negative. Right, right. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so a negative feedback loop is like, uh, here's a classic example, our audience are fitness people, so they'll know this. A classic uh, negative feedback loop is, I take testosterone, my body recognizes it and slows down or stops its own production of testosterone. That's bad. To balance me out, yeah. right? To, well, that's just the way your body balances out. Sure, okay. Now, a positive feedback loop amplifies as you score, as you go through it. So here's a classic example. I know example. where you're going with this. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a classic example. I'm sitting here and I'm th- I start thinking about something stressful so my heart starts to beat fast. I start to feel my heart beat fast. I start to think about my heart beating fast. I start to worry about my heart beating fast. So now I get more anxiety, which then makes it beat faster, which then makes me more anxious and it starts to compound and this is how people have anxiety attacks. Yeah. It's literally this positive feedback loop. So one of the most important things you could do with stress and anxiety is to interrupt that cycle. And one of the be- and so you were talking about CBD that's one way is where I'm taking something that is minimizing the physical effects of anxiety. So it's not taking away your problems, but it is minimizing the the physical sensation of anxiety, which helps interrupt that positive feedback loop. Very similar to what you're talking about with the going out in nature too. Because when you hit yeah, touch yeah. those your feet hit the sand 100%. and you're barefoot, you 100%. interrupt that. All of a sudden I'm thinking about and this is this is what uh, we love to talk about this on the show because for so many years uh, when people would explain this to me in the in the past it would sound so woo woo. Yeah, like you know? earthing. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, sh- ground, ground. that <laughs> right. was one of the things where I had somebody on that, that's to your earlier earlier question. Something I had to call somebody out on was that earthing stuff and I was like, "Bro, this sounds like total bullshit." Well, it's the way they yeah. explain it. Yeah. They, Ions they, and stuff. Right. That's it. They, they yeah. explain it in a very non-scientific way and to be quite frankly, we still don't fully understand That's it. Just but it. what we do fucking know for sure, getting back to Sal's point, is that if you've got this this feedback loop going on and it and it's just this vicious cycle and it's accelerating accelerating, one of the best things you could do, like he's saying, is interrupt that. One of the easiest ways to do that is to put yourself in a all your feet all of a sudden yeah, touching the sand stimulus. because now you're not thinking about that stress all of a sudden oh while well, you're feeling the sand and you're moving that it's quiet around you you know you hear the birds you hear whatever it's just interrupting that loop and stopping what can potentially become a recruitment pattern and this is how people develop uh, these disorders with anxiety or stress where even though things may be working out for you, all of a sudden you're like, why am I still feeling shitty or what's going on? Or, you know, it's, it starts to get out of control and breathing is part of it. So one of the things that you might want to do is try practicing belly breathing uh, throughout the day. And belly breathing literally is you stop what's going on. You breathe deep into your diaphragm so that your belly expands. So you feel your belly fill up. You Man, hold just, that. Yeah. You hold that breath. You get in as deep as you possibly can. You hold it for about five seconds. Then you breathe out real slow. Then you hold again for five seconds as your breath is, is out. And then you repeat that cycle. And what it does is it interrupts the cycle and it prevents you from creating this po- or from feeding this positive feedback loop and from creating this recruitment pattern because what will happen over time, and I know this, my, my girlfriend experienced this, where she has trouble breathing and it's because she developed this recruitment pattern from when she went through a very stressful period in her life and now shit's not stressful and yet- why do I feel like I'm short of breath? This is actually quite common. Chewing your food is an, and this is all. Stu- it's all. It sounds stupid. It sounds woo woo. Um, and Adam's completely right. What ends up happening is, and I'll use another example. We'll talk about fasting. Not that this necessarily uh, is what you do for stress, but this is just a great uh, way to illustrate what I'm talking about. Fasting has existed for thousands and thousands of years across cultures and in all major religions. So what that tells you right there is, let's see, if all these ancient cultures recommend fasting for health, and if all these religions from Buddhism to Islam to Christianity to Judaism to Hinduism, I mean every religion, advocates fasting for health, there's probably something to it. Now, the problem comes from people trying to explain it in their own words, which sounds like detoxify your body and it's good for the spirit. Us people who grew up in Western societies hear that. And I'm thinking, it's bullshit. Like, that's not how it right. works. You know, the chi of your body, the Chinese energy flowing, that's bullshit. That does. But when you, when you, for fucking acupuncture has existed for thousands of years, people say it works. We just don't know how to explain it yet, but there's something to it. Same thing with grounding. Same thing with breathing. Same thing with sunlight. Same thing with chewing your food. Same thing with meditating. All these little things, you might not know how they work, but they've existed for a long time. 
if you start implementing what you know how to control, Dude, game changer. it makes you so much more Game effective. changer for you, Jordan. You said something that I totally connected to earlier uh, with the whole your brain going. So I've struggled with this for a very long time. I was never a good sleeper, ever. I've never been a great sleeper. I've never been somebody who lays his head down on the pillow and is out and then wakes up. Oh, man. And it's I'm very cerebral. I can't stop thinking. I'm always thinking about stuff that's going on and most a lot around, centered around business, right? And so- Katrina can feel me like breathing differently when I'm laying in bed and thinking like, I'll be dead silent. Lights are out. We've been laying, I've been laying there for an hour and she'll kind of roll over and like elbow me and she'll be like, stop it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she can tell just by the way I'm breathing that I'm, not, I'm thinking so hard. Yeah. And so what she's, what we've started as a practice now when she catches that, cause I still have these bad habits. It doesn't fucking go away. I'm still, I still fall in these bad it's patterns. A pattern, yeah. It's a pattern. And but we've learned to recognize it. When she recognizes it, she'll roll over and she'll be half asleep and she'll elbow me and she'll go, Let's let's breathe together. And we'll literally do ten deep, real deep breaths, five second holds, five just box breathing, right? We'll box breathe for literally like ten reps and it's a trip, dude. I can feel my body go Bro, you'll feel really? some you'll feel yeah. tingly sometimes in your yeah. hands and feet. I do like, get that. Yeah. I do get the tingle thing and uh there was a point at which I was practicing. I learned. I took this class where they ki- at the end of the class they they kidnap you and throw you in the back of the van. Have you guys have you guys heard about this? No. 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 Oh this? shit, dude! <laughs> you signed up for this? Yes. <laughs> oh man, this class was dope as hell. Okay, so this is an herb. It's called urban escape and evasion. And what happens is you sit in a hotel room or whatever, and you talk for a few days, and they teach you like how to stash things in a city, how to hide stuff, how to like make improvised oh like, weapons what? or whatever. And then they also teach you like how people track you and how to like do some basic disguise stuff. It's like the fug- it's like a fugitive class. And the the culmination at the end of this like three or four day course is they put it. They don't like attack you, but you show up on the final day. They put a bag over your head. They handcuff you. They put you in the back of a van and they drive you to like a Home Depot, and they just leave you in the van. And it's like you're being kidnapped. They throw and while they're driving, they're they're like throwing water on you and stuff. Like not waterboarding, but how they're much throwing did you pay for this? <laughs> I, I was comp, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> But uh, they leave you in the back of this van, and it's, like, starting to get hot. And what you do is you you take out a, a bobby pin. They tell you, like, stash a bobby pin in a place where you can reach it when you're handcuffed, and you should, like, always have this on you or whatever if you're paranoid. But anyway, you take it, you break it, you make a handcuff key out of it, you pick the cuffs, you get the bag off your head, you know, you undo the leg irons, you look around because the kidnap, quote-unquote, kidnappers are around somewhere. You look around, you get out of the van, and then they immediately start tracking you. And there's, like, 20... 15 to 20 volunteers all across the city of LA where I took this class that are just, you have to make your way to this end point, which is like your escape point. And all along the way, there's all these people tracking you that have already taken the class. And a lot of them are like detectives, private investigators, like like cops and stuff. And so I'm walking along the LA river and I'm like, they're never going to find me here. And then I hear somebody be like, Hey, and I'm like, shit. So I'm running away. And then I like get into a building and I go into a fast food place and I go in the bathroom and I like do the disguise thing. And I get to one of my hidden stashes and I like take out my other disguise thing. And I'm sitting there and I see them coming for me. And I sit down at this little league game and the coach is like, what are you doing? Crazy person. <laughs> and I finally think they're all gone. And then I turn around and the guys are sitting there and they're like, this is pretty good. We did walk by you twice, but you're the only guy watching a little league game. And it's a little weird. And I was like, damn it. So then they're like, all right, you have to go back and another place and then you try again and you're just constantly going through this why the hell did we get on this subject oh box breathing (laughs) so they were teaching us box breathing because they're like look you're not going to be able to think if someone freaking kidnaps you and throws you into a van or if someone is like attacked you and they got you like hogtied you're going to be freaking out Mm -hmm. and you need to like do this box breathing and i remember learning the box breathing thing and feeling like little lightheaded, which is not how you do it. But uh, then my hands and and fingers would be tingling and stuff. And I just thought like, this is weird. How come my body feels this? And it's like the oxygenation. You're just not used to it. Yes. And it's, it's really, again, it's a, it's a, it's a technique to bring the level down, stop the positive feedback loop, Mm -hmm. interrupt it. And now you can have your wits about you because when you're in that state, it isn't the frontal lobe that's processing things. It's not the smart party or the conscious part of you. It's the subconscious, which if you don't interrupt that subconscious, you could fucking try stopping it all you want. Yeah. 
it ain't going to happen. Well, think of it like an evolutionary, right? Going back to like the young boy hunting for his first kill or whatever like that, and like how scary that had been, and probably how shitty his first throw was. And it's like after you've <laughs> done after you've done this a hundred times and stuff like that, like that that fear starts to settle down. It's not so much that the threat is no longer there; the threat is still there. It's that you've learned how to mentally control that and calm your nerves, pay attention to what you're doing, aim sh- ready, aim, shoot, fire type of deal. Well, this is the same thing with what we're talking about in life is, you know, you've got all this shit, all these distractions, all these scary things going on. And sometimes the the best and simplest thing that we can do is just fucking stop, get connected or grounded, whatever you want to call it, focus on your breathing and get recalibrated and be like, okay, let me hone in here. And it's cra- Every time I've learned to do that, like things start to unfold in front of me. It's like, oh shit, dude. It's I had- a secret. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, if it, but it feels I like I hate that shit. Don't get me started. Yeah, yeah, no, me too. That's no. not our I, thing. See, I hate I, that. What's your, what's your, uh, Jordan, what is your, do you have a higher purpose? Do you tell yourself, like, do you feel like you got this higher purpose? Yeah. Because um, I feel like you do, but yeah. I want I don't. I want to hear what you think. Yeah, it sounds cheesy when I, whenever I talk about this stuff, but I'll tell you, yeah. I mean, my kind of goal in life here is to, be able to have be able to convey wisdom to people that I feel like is is a little bit hidden and I don't mean that teaching people secret knowledge but I mean like learning real stuff is actually quite hard we go to school we learn a bunch of stuff not most of it is not useful we grow up we take a job we start training we learn a lo- bunch of stuff that maybe works in one situation but it's not necessarily useful so as as humans we don't grow that much unless we're like reading self help books all the time and then you're kind of like reading stuff like The Secret where it's like just envision it in manifestation <laughs> and it's like, you know, no. So I'm getting, I love getting the the people that I do for the show, for example, getting them together, uh, creating products or creating articles or creating content, especially conversations where someone can listen in and go, wow, I just learned something from a general. I would never have had access to this person. Even if I did, I wouldn't know what to ask them. And now I've got this. And I feel like helping people grow like that is something that has driven me for such a long time. And it's so important because otherwise there's all these people with really awesome potential and they're just kind of going through life thinking, yeah, I've got my job and I've got my hobbies and stuff, but they don't think about how they're going to be able to level up without looking at this stack of self-help books and going, man, I don't have time to read all this stuff. Mm. So I want to make it entertaining. I want to make it fun. I want to make it easily digestible. And I want people to be able to listen and go, okay, cool. I learned something from the show. I like this. Or I, I re- learned something from this guy in this video or in this product or whatever. And that for me is really important because I think that there there's so many people out there that have learned awesome, amazing things from, you know, Shaquille O'Neal or the, the General McChrystal or like the, the, somebody I've had recently on the show, even uh, like lawyers and, and these crisis management people or even investors. And their wisdom is just off limits unless they write a book and then you buy that book and you read that right. and then you get that piece out. And I'm like, no, I'll do that. Right. Yep. And then I'll talk to this person and I'll have them tell this stuff in a way that's entertaining and then you can apply it right away. So instead of spending 10 hours, you spent 45 minutes with me. Yeah. And that for me is... is that's what I love do. I love doing that. I would have guessed mm-hmm. that because yeah. you did that right now on this podcast. Well, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, did for sure. You I, did. You just did. You served it. I, I want to be respectful of your time. I know that you have another yeah. meeting at twelve o'clock, and we're coming up on that already right now. Oh, dude. Man. So this will not be the last time we do this. Hopefully, we'll see your face around here a little. We bit We got more. your back, dude. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We yeah. got Thank your you back, guys. bro. Yeah. So, so excited! Yeah, excited to see things you, go forward. We'll make sure we do a nice little commercial and direct people where to go find the podcast and everything. Man, excited to see you. You look great, man, and look forward to this next year for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, the Jordan Harbinger Show, I, I need all the help I can get from show fans from before or people that are willing to try something new. I love the Mind Pump audience. Great audience, really cool people, and I hear from you, your peeps all the time, and cool. I I need the support more than ever now. You Excellent. Know? Right Thanks, on, brother. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. 
If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support. And until next time, this is Mind Pump.